anything that the country of Scotland is famous for? Do you know what the national emblem is or what musical instrument we associate with Scotland? Or do you know any special Scottish food? What about a very special monster from Scotland? Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to Journey with Story. So let's see if you were able to answer my questions. Scotland is famous, first of all, for a long list of inventors. It's also famous for its heather dappled mountains and shaggy highland cattle. The musical instrument that most people associate with Scotland is the bagpipes. As for food, well, there's haggis, shortbread, and something called a bannock, which is a kind of like a scone. And the special monster we Scots like to boast about is... Yes, Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster. Well, today's episode is a special playlist for you of three of our most popular Scottish stories. The Wee Bannock, Inventor MacGregor, written by me with lots of Scottish words in it, and... Capo Rushes, a Scottish version of Cinderella. Before we begin, a shout out to Mary Carrico from Ohio, who had her ninth birthday on June the 15th, and she sent me a most marvellous drawing from a recent episode of a poem called The Wind and the Moon. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> and another shout out to Hannah, age seven and a half, who sent me her drawing inspired by our episode of Mama Ostrich. Splendid work, Hannah. Thank you. Remember, you can send me your drawings at www.kathleenpelly.com or at www.journeywithstory.com and you just might get a shout out too. Now, let's take a journey with this special playlist of the Wee Bannock, Inventor MacGregor, and Cap O' Rushes. Let's take a journey with the Wee Bannock. Long ago in Scotland, in a wee cottage by a stream, there lived an old man and an old woman. They were rather poor, but still they were content enough, for they had a big fat cow who gave them sweet milk and a big brood of hens who gave them delicious brown eggs, and so they never went hungry. One day, the old woman decided to make some bannocks as a special treat. She stirred the oats and the buttermilk and the fruit. She rolled out the mixture and shaped it into two round bannocks and one wee bannock and put them all to bake in a pan on the stove. When the old man came in from milking the cow, he had worked up a great appetite, and as soon as he caught a whiff of the sweet, smelling bannocks, he grabbed one of the big ones straight from the pan and gobbled it up in one bite. At once, the old woman snatched the other big bannock, and she too gobbled it down in one gulp, for all that baking had sharpened her appetite. Now, when the wee bannock saw what had happened to the two big bannocks, he thought, I'm not going to let that happen to me. And he jumped down from the pan and rolled across the floor and out the door. Look, look, cried the old woman. That wee bannock is running away. Catch it, catch it. The pair of them chased the wee bannock down the garden path. But they were old and the bannock was nimble and fast as a fox. And as he scampered along, he cried out, I'm the wee bannock who sprang from a pan. Try and catch me if you can. The wee bannock ran and ran and ran until at last he came to the next house where a tailor and his wife lived. Look, look, cried the tailor, it's a wee bannock. It would make a fine dish for our supper, good wife, catch it. The tailor's wife threw a wooden spoon at the wee bannock, but she missed and it hit the tailor instead. The wee bannock laughed and laughed as he whirled round and round their feet and way out the door and on his way, crying... I'm the wee bannock who sprang from a pan. Try and catch me if you can. The wee bannock ran and ran and ran until 
we came to the next house, where a woman was churning butter. A wee bannock, she said. That'll be just the thing to go with this butter. She put out her hand to try to catch him, but the bannock wiggled this way and that, running under her feet and almost tripping her up. Yeah, we scallywag, she shouted, and threw her shoe at it, but it missed, and the wee bannock whirled out the door and down the road, crying, I'm the wee bannock who sprang from a pan, try and catch me if you can. The wee bannock ran and ran until he came to the mill where the miller was filling up sacks with flour. Well, I never, said the miller, a wee bannock, that's good luck and it will be just fine with a mug of ale for my supper. He reached out to snatch the bannock, but the wee bannock was too quick for him, and he dodged under the sack and over the millstone. The miller threw his cap at him, but that wee bannock ducked and dodged and skedaddled out the door on his way, crying, I'm the wee bannock who sprang from a pan. Try and catch me if you can. It was growing dark now, and the wee bannock was very exhausted from all his exertions. He spotted a cosy dark burrow beneath the bushes, and in he jumped and soon fell fast asleep. In the morning, he was awoken by a mother bunny and her brood of baby bunnies. None of them had ever seen a bannock before, and had no idea what to make of the strange wee creature in their midst. Who are you? demanded the mother bunny. Ah, I'm just a wee bannock. What's a bannock? All the baby bunnies piped up. I'm a playmate for bunnies, said the bannock, and he ran off, crying. I'm the wee bannock who sprang from the pan. Try and catch me if you can. And that's just what those baby bunnies did all day long. They scampered and raced and chased, and by evening they were so exhausted they fell fast asleep after their supper. And so delighted was the mother bunny to have a playmate to keep her baby bunnies busy that she invited the wee bannock to make his home there with them safe in their cosy wee burrow. And that's just what he did. Let's take a journey with Inventor McGregor, written by Kathleen T. Pelly and published by Farrer, Strauss and Giro. Hector McGregor lived in a higgledy-piggledy house with a cheery wife, five children and a hen called Hattie. Mendit McGregor, everyone called him, because he could mend most anything that needed mending, they said, from fishing rods and fairy wands to top hats and rubber ducks. Day after day, people brought him their squeaky skates, squiggly spoons, wobbly wagons, tangled kites, knotted yo-yos, headless dolls and footless soldiers. With a blob of glue or a squirt of oil, with a tap of his hammer, or a shimmy here and a shimmy there, Hector MacGregor mended whatever needed mending and sent everyone on their way with a skip, a hop and a hum. In between his gluing and oiling and hammering, Hector MacGregor liked to stroll down the winding lane at the back of his house, where the bluebells grow and the smell of wet heather lingered long and sweet. There he sang a snippet of a song, or twirled a whirl of a fling, or sometimes he pulled out his palette and his easel to paint a picture. Then back to his mending he went with a heart that was both happy and full. And every night before the shades were drawn, Hector MacGregor nestled his fiddle beneath his chin and played a rousing reel or a sweeping strathspey, while all around the house, from pantry to parlour, his cheery wife, five children, and his hen called Hattie, whirled and whooshed and whooshed. One day, Angus the postman stopped by to have his bag patched. That wee scoundrel of a Scotty down Loopy Lane has torn my bag to tatters again, he grumbled. Ah, dear me, said Hector MacGregor. We need to stop that scallywag. Leave it to me, I'll think of something. 
The next day, Hector MacGregor handed Angus a shiny new bag covered with all sorts of buttons, dangling cords and flapping flaps. What's this? asked Angus. It's a barking bag, said Hector MacGregor. Whenever you see that Scotty, just push this button, flip this flap, and it'll set up a barking noise as loud as a hundred wolf hounds. With his new bag slung over his shoulder, Angus the postman went on his way. By the end of the day, the whole town had heard the story of how the barking bag had sent that Scotty fleeing with his tail between his legs. Now everyone wanted Hector MacGregor to concoct some thingamabob or thingamajig to make their world a little better or brighter. When Mrs Mackay complained about her boys who doddled and dilly-dallied all the way to school, Hector MacGregor invented a pair of detachable monkey tails so they could swing and swoop and swish through the treetops all the way to school. To lighten the children's school bags, Hector MacGregor invented a paper pump that blew up their books with helium. Now off to school they sauntered with their books, bobbing and dancing above them like a bunch of bobbing balloons. For Mrs MacIver, who had triplets and a husband at sea, Hector MacGregor pieced together some helping hands that she could strap to her shoulder. Every morning, with a flick of a switch, off it went, wiping noses, zipping zippers, tying laces and holding hands. For Jamie Campbell, who always slept through his alarm clock, Hector MacGregor invented an alarm bed that popped his head from the pillow like a jack from his box. And for wee Willie Beatty, the smallest boy in his class, Hector MacGregor cobbled a pair of bouncing boots so that he could see over walls and fences and heads. Inventor MacGregor, everyone called him now, because he could invent most anything that needed inventing, they said. And in between his inventing, Hector MacGregor still strolled down the winding lane at the back of his house, where the bluebells grew and the smell of wet heather lingered long and sweet. There he sang his snippet of a song, painted his picture, or twirled a whirl of a fling. One day, the President of the Royal Society of Inventors, Nigel Withers, paid Hector MacGregor a visit. Congratulations, Mr MacGregor! He said, we are so impressed with all your inventions that we want you to become a member of our society. We want you to start working for us immediately in your very own laboratory in the city. Why, thank you, said Hector MacGregor, but I don't think I'll need a laboratory. You see, I like working here where I can sing and paint and... Oh, no, 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 protested Mr Withers. Real inventors don't have time for all that nonsense. They invent... That's all. Just imagine how many more gadgets and gizmos you'll be able to invent with a clear head and no distractions. Hector MacGregor scratched his chin. Hmm, he said, maybe you're right. And the next week, Hector MacGregor set off to work in the city in his very own laboratory. Mr Withers gave him a long white coat and a badge that read, Inventor MacGregor. Outside his door hung a sign with the words, Quiet, Inventor, Inventing. All day, Hector MacGregor sat at his desk in the laboratory, thinking about what to invent. He thought, and he thought, and he thought. So long did he think that by the time he arrived home at night, all his children were sound asleep in bed, and his cheery wife sat dozing by the fire with Hattie the hen in her lap. The next day was no different, nor the next, nor the one after that. Day after day, week after week, Hector MacGregor sat at his desk in the laboratory, staring out the window at the toy shop across the street. He thought and he thought and he thought. But no matter how long or how hard he thought, no ideas came to him. Soon people stopped calling him Inventor MacGregor. Whenever he walked on the street, the people whispered to one another, Shh, it's sad. A mistake. He's not a real inventor. Hector MacGregor hung his head in shame. Whenever Mr Withers popped his head around the door of the laboratory, Hector MacGregor saw the frown in his eyes, and again he hung his head in shame. Oh, maybe I'm not a real inventor after all, he thought. 
Maybe I should give back my badge and my coat and my laboratory. But as he was thinking this thought, he noticed some painters painting the toy shop across the road. Suddenly, an urge tickled down his arms and into his fingertips. Up he bolted, out the door he flew, across the street he dashed. Quick, quick, he cried to the painters. I need to borrow your brushes and paint. Huh? Bewildered and befuddled, the men handed them over. Back to the laboratory raced Hector McGregor with the paint pots dangling from his arms. Clutching a paintbrush in each hand, he began to slosh and swish the paint across the laboratory wall. Splish! Splash! Splosh! First, he painted a picture of his cheery wife sitting beneath the plum tree at the side of his house. Next, he painted a picture of his five children paddling in the pond by the front gate. Finally, he painted a picture of his hen, Hattie, pecking her cotton at the bottom of the winding lane. Then he threw down his brushes and beamed at all the faces he loved, splashed across the wall. With a hoot and a holler, he dashed out the door and flew down the street. Where are you going? Mr. Withers called after him. Home, cried Hector McGregor. Home to my happy, happy home. Back at his higgledy-piggledy house, Hector McGregor kissed his cheery wife, his five children, and his hen called Hattie. He strolled on the winding lane at the back of his house, where the bluebells grew and the smell of wet heather lingered long and sweet. There he sang a snippet of a song. He twirled a whirl of a fling, and he painted a picture of a marmalade cat curled up in a patch of sunlight. Then back to his inventing he went with a heart that was happy and full. Week after week, one more incredible invention after another spilled out of him. Peppermint pencils, doggy wellingtons, jelly bean erasers, tartan grass, mufflers to warm noses, and books that glowed in the dark. Inventor McGregor, everyone called him again, because he could invent most anything that needed inventing, they said, just as long as... He could sing and paint and fiddle and fling and love all that he had to love. And every night before the shades were drawn, Inventor McGregor nestled his fiddle beneath his chin and he played a rousing reel or a sweeping Strathspey. While all around the house, from pantry to parlour, his cheery wife, five children and his hen called Hattie whirled and whooshed and whish. Now, let's take a journey with Cap O' Rushes, and this version was written by Flora Annie Steele. Once upon a time, a long, long while ago, when all the world was young and all sorts of strange things happened, there lived a very rich gentleman whose wife had died, leaving him three lovely daughters. They were the apple of his eye, and he loved them with all his heart. Now one day, he wanted to find out if they loved him in return. So he said to the eldest, How much do you love me, my dear? And she answered as pat as may be, As I love my life. Oh, very good, my dear, said he, and he gave her a kiss. Then he said to the second girl, How much do you love me, my dear? And she answered as swift as thought, Better than all the world beside. Good, he replied, and patted her on the cheek. Then he turned to the youngest, who was also the prettiest. And how much do you love me, my dearest? Now, the youngest daughter was not only pretty, she was clever. So she thought a moment. Then she said slowly, I love you as fresh meat loves salt. Now, when her father heard this, he was very angry because he really loved her more than the others. What? he said. If that is all you give me in return for all I've given you, out of my house you go. 
Things were there and then. He turned her out of the home where she had been born and bred and shut the door in her face. Not knowing where to go, the poor girl wandered on and on. She wandered on until she came to a big marsh where the reeds grew ever so tall and the rushes swayed in the wind like a field of corn. There she sat down and plaited some rushes to make herself an overall and then a cap to match. In this way she hid her fine clothes as well as her beautiful golden hair that was all set with milk-white pearls. For she was a wise girl and thought that in such a desolate countryside perhaps some robber might fall in with her and try to rob her of her fine clothes and jewels. It took a long time to braid the dress and cap, and while she braided she sang a little song. Hide my hair, O cap o' rushes, hide my heart, O robe o' rushes. Sure my answer had no fault, I love him more than he loves salt. And the birds of the marsh listened and sang back to her. Capo rushes shed no tear. Robo rushes have no fear. With these words, if fault he'd find, sure your father must be blind. When her task was finished, the girl put on her robe of rushes, and it hid all her fine clothes, and she put on the cap, and it hid all her beautiful hair, so that she looked quite a common country girl. But the marsh birds flew away singing as they flew, Capo rushes, we can see, Robo rushes, what you be, Fair and clean and fine and tidy, So you'll be whate'er betide you. By this time, the girl was very, very hungry, so she wandered on and she wandered on. But nearly a cottage or a hamlet did she see, till just at sun setting, she came on a great house on the edge of the marsh. It had a fine front door to it, but mindful of her dress of rushes, she went round to the back. And there she saw a strapping fat scullion maid washing pots and pans with a very sulky face. So, being a clever girl, she guessed what the maid was wanting and she said, If I may have a night's lodging, I will scrub the pots and pans for you. Why, ears luck, replied the scullery maid ever so pleased. Oh, I was just wanting badly to go walking with my sweetheart. So if you will do my work, you shall share my bed and have a bite of my supper. Only mind you scrub the pots clean, or cook will scold me. Now, next morning, the pots were scraped so clean that they looked like no, and the saucepans were polished like silver, and the cook said to the scullion, Oh, clean these pots, not you, I'll swear. So the maid had no choice but to tell the truth. At once the cook told the scullery maid to be on her way, for what use was she when this new girl was so much better? But the girl stood up to the cook, saying, The maid was kind to me and gave me a night's lodging, she said, so now I will stay without wage and do the dirty work for her. So Kappa Rushes, for so they called her since she would give no other name, stayed on and cleaned the pots and scraped the saucepans. Now it so happened that the son of the household came of age, and to celebrate the occasion, a ball was given to the neighbourhood, for the young man was a grand dancer and loved nothing so well as a night of dancing. It was a very fine party, and after supper was served, the servants were allowed to go and watch the festivities from the gallery of the ballroom. But Capo Rushes refused to go, for she also was a grand dancer, and she was afraid that when she heard the fiddles starting a merry jig, she might start dancing. So she excused herself by saying she was too tired with scraping pots and washing saucepans, 
and when the others went off, she crept up to her bed. But her bedroom door had been left open, and as she lay in her bed, she could hear the fiddlers fiddling away and the tramp of dancing feet. Then she upped and off with her cap and robe of rushes, and there she was, ever so fine and tidy. She was in the ballroom in a trice, joining in the jig, and none was more beautiful or better dressed than she. While, as for her dancing, her master's son singled her out at once and with the finest of bows engaged her as his partner for the rest of the night. So she danced away to her heart's content while the whole room was agog trying to find out who the beautiful young stranger could be. But of course, she gave them no clues and finally making some excuse, slipped away before the ball finished. So when her fellow servants came to bed, there she was in hers, in her cap and robe of rushes, pretending to be fast asleep. Next morning, however, the maids could talk of nothing but the beautiful stranger. "'You should have seen her,' they said. "'She was the loveliest young lady as ever you see, not a bit like the likes away. "'Her golden hair was all silvered with pearls and her dress, oh, law, "'You wouldn't believe how she was dressed. "'Young master never took his eyes off her.' And Caporushes only smiled and said with a twinkle in her eye, I should like to see her, but I don't think I ever shall. Oh, yes, you will, they replied, for young master has ordered another ball tonight in hopes she will come to dance again. But that evening Caporushes refused once more to go to the gallery, saying she was too tired with cleaning pots and scraping saucepans. And once more when she heard the fiddlers fiddling, she said to herself, I must have one dance, just one with the young master. He dances so beautifully. For she felt certain he would dance with her. And sure enough, when she had upped and offed with her cap and robe of rushes, there he was at the door waiting for her to come for he had determined to dance with no one else. So he took her by the hand, and they danced down the ballroom. It was a sight of all sights. Never were such dancers. So young, so handsome, so fine, and so merry. But once again, Caporushes kept to herself and just slipped away on some excuse in time so that when her fellow servants came to their beds, they found her in hers, pretending to be fast asleep. But her cheeks were all flushed and her breath came fast. So they said, She is dreaming. We hope her dreams are happy. But next morning, they were full of what she had missed. Never was such a beautiful young gentleman as young master. Never was such a beautiful young lady. Never was such beautiful dancing. And everyone else had stopped theirs to look on. And Caporushes, with a twinkle in her eyes, said, I should like to see her, but I'm sure I never shall. Oh, yes, they replied. If you come tonight, you are sure to see her, for young master has ordered another ball in hopes... The beautiful stranger will come again. It's easy to say he is madly in love with her. Then Caporushes told herself she would not dance again, since it was not fit for a happy young master to be in love with his scullery maid. But alas, the moment she heard the fiddlers fiddling, she just upped and off with her rushes, and there she was, fine and tidy as ever. She didn't even have to brush her beautiful golden hair, and once again she was in the ballroom in a trice, dancing away with young master, who never took his eyes off her, and implored her to tell him who she was. But she only told him that she never, never, never would come to dance any more, so that he must say goodbye, and he held her hand so fast that she had a job to get away, and lo and behold, his ring came off his finger, and as she ran up to her bed, there it was in her hand. She had just time to put on her cap and robe of rushes when her fellow servants came trooping in and found her awake. 
It was the noise you made coming upstairs. She made an excuse, but they said, Not way, it is the whole place that is in an uproar, searching for the beautiful stranger. Young master, he tried to detain her, but she slipped from him like an eel. But he declares he will find her, for if he doesn't, he will die of love of her. And Caporushes laughed. Oh, young men don't die of love, says she. He will find someone else. But he didn't. He spent his whole time looking for his beautiful dancer. But go where he might and ask whom he would, he never heard anything about her. And day by day, he grew thinner and thinner and paler and paler. Until at last, he took to his bed. And the housekeeper came to the cook and said, Cook the nicest dinner you can cook, for young master is eating nothing. Then the cook prepared soups and jellies and creams and roast chicken and bread sauce, but the young man would have none of them. And Caporushes cleaned the pots and scraped the saucepans and said nothing. Then the housekeeper came crying and said to the cook, Prepare some gruel for young master. Perhaps he'd take that. If not, he will die for love of the beautiful dancer. If she could see him now, she would have pity on him. So the cook began to make the gruel, and Caporushes left, scraping saucepans, and watched her. Let me stir it, she said, while you fetch a cup from the pantry room. So Caporushes stirred the gruel, and what did she do? But slip young master's ring into it before the cook came back. Then the butler took the cup upstairs on a silver salver. But when the young master saw it, he waved it away, till the butler with tears begged him just to taste it. So the young master took a silver spoon and stirred the gruel, and he felt something hard at the bottom of the cup. And when he fished it up, lo, it was his own ring. Then he sat up in bed and said quite loud, "'Send for the cook!' And when she came, he asked her who made the gruel. I did, she said, for she was half pleased and half frightened. Then he looked at her all over and said, No, you didn't, you're too stout. Tell me who made it and you shan't be harmed. Then the cook began to cry. If you please, sir, I did make it, but but Caporushes stirred it. And who is Caporushes? asked the young man. If you please, sir... Caporushes is the scullion, whimpered the cook. Then the young man sighed and fell back on his pillow. Oh, send Caporushes here, he said in a faint voice, for he really was very near dying. And when Caporushes came, he just looked at her cap and her robe of rushes and turned his face to the wall. But he asked her in a weak little voice, Oh, from whom did you get that ring? Now when Caporushes saw the poor young man so weak and worn with love for her, her heart melted, and she replied softly, From him that gave it to me, she said, and oft with her cap and robe of rushes, and there she was as fine and tidy as ever, with her beautiful golden hair all silvered over with pearls. And when the young man caught sight of her, he sat up in bed as strong as may be and drew her to him and gave her a great big kiss. So, of course, they were to be married, in spite of her being only a scullery maid, for she told no one who she was. Now everyone far and near was asked to the wedding. Amongst the invited guests was Cap O'Rush's father, who from grief at losing his favourite daughter had lost his sight and was very dull and miserable. However, as a friend of the family, he had to come to the young master's wedding. Now the marriage feast was to be the finest ever seen, but Cap O'Rush's went to her friend the cook and said, "'Dress every dish,' without one mite of salt. Well, that'll be rare and nasty, replied the cook. But 
because she prides herself on having let Caporusha stir the gruel and so save the young master's life, she did as she was asked and dressed every dish for the wedding breakfast without one mite of salt. Now, when the company sat down to table, their faces were full of smiles and content, for all the dishes looked so nice and tasty. But no sooner had the guests begun to eat than their faces fell, for nothing can be tasty without salt. Then Caporush's blind father, whom his daughter had seated next to her, burst out crying. What is the matter? she asked him. Then the old man sobbed. I had a daughter whom I loved dearly, dearly, and I asked her how much she loved me, and she replied, as fresh meat loves salt. And I was angry with her and turned her out of the house and home, for I thought she didn't love me at all. But now I see she loved me best of all. And as he said the words, his eyes were opened, and there beside him was his daughter, lovelier than ever. And she gave him one hand, and her husband, the young master, the other. And she laughed, saying, I love you both, as fresh meat loves salt. And after that, they were all happy forevermore. story from these remember if journey with story is one of your favorite podcasts please take a moment to rate review and share it with others cheerio then join me next time for journey with story music and post-production was by colette jonas